Good morning, everyone. Okay. Vicissitudes of life, isn't it? You've been a wonderful spring week, and then we have winter back today. One day your team's in the grand final, and then it loses. Such is life. Things have to go on, though, don't they? Okay. The, the game is here. <laughs> yes. Okay. Let's begin our worship this morning. <clears throat> And as usual, we'll begin with our welcome to country or acknowledgement of country. The Lutheran Church of Australia acknowledges that our loving creator God first gave the land on which we are placed to the peoples of the First Nations who have walked and cared for this land since before recorded time. At Holy Cross, we particularly acknowledge the Ngunnawal people. We thank God for the land's traditional custodians and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging as we travel this journey of reconciliation in Australia. So, let's begin. God has been our dwelling place in all generations before the mountains were raised, were raised up, before the universe was even formed, God has been there for us. So, so let us live in him, rooted and established in the faith of Christ, abounding in thanksgiving. Love God, love your neighbour. All the laws of Moses and the teachings of the prophets hang on these two commandments. May the love of God be upon us, establishing whatever is loving in the work of our hands. Yes, let God establish all that is loving in the work of our hands. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's confess our uh, sins before God and before one another. Jesus said, everything in the law and the prophets hangs on two things. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul and mind and strength, and you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I confess to you, most loving God, and to you, my Christian family, that although I honour Jesus Christ, I fall far short of his example. I am a disciple of little faith. My prayers are selfish and my sacrifice is rare. But despite our sin, we know our God is merciful. I pray for the forgiveness that renovated Peter the compassion that healed Mary Magdalene, the grace that accepted Thomas, and the love that wiped away the tears of Mary. Who will rescue us from the, this body of defeat and death? God alone, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Lord, we hear your voice. Child, children, your sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, go in peace. Thank you, God of faithfulness, love and new life. The Lord be with you, and with your spirit. Let us pray that we love God and our neighbour. Thank you, ever-living God, for giving us your only Son. Move us to love you with all our heart, soul, mind and strength, and to love our neighbour as we love ourselves. We ask this through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. 
Our first reading today comes from the book of Leviticus, chapter 19. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to all the congregation of the people of Israel and say to them, You shall be holy, for I, the Lord your God, am holy. You shall not render an unjust judgment. You shall not be partial to the poor or defer to the great. With justice you shall judge your neighbour. You shall not go around as a slanderer among your people and you shall not profit by the blood of your neighbour. I am the Lord. You shall not hate in your heart anyone of your kin. You shall re reprove your neighbour or you will incur guilt yourself. You shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against any of your people, but you shall love your neighbour as yourself. I am the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. And our second reading today comes from the book of Thessalonians, chapter 2. You yourselves know, brothers and sisters, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully mistreated at Philippi, as you know, we had courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of great opposition. For our appeal does not spring from deceit or impure motives or trickery, just as you have been approved by God to be entrusted with the message of the gospel, even so we speak not to please mortals, but to please God who tests our hearts. As you know, and as God is our witness, we never came with words of flattery or with a pretext for greed, nor did we seek praise from mortals, whether from you or from others, though we might have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nurse, tenderly caring for her own children. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you have become very dear to us. This is the word of the Lord. I invite you to stand now for the reading of the Gospel. <clears throat> and our Gospel reading this morning comes from Matthew chapter 22, reading from verse 34, the greatest commandment. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together and one of them, a lawyer, only a lawyer could do this, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? He said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and first commandment. And a second is like it. You shall love your neighbour as yourself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Now while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them this question, What do you think of the Messiah? Whose son is he? They said to him, The son of David. He said to them, How is it then that David by the Spirit calls him Lord, saying, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I put your enemies under, my, under your feet. If David thus calls him Lord, how can he be his son? No one was able to give him an answer, nor from that day did anyone dare to ask him any more questions. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise, Praise be to you, O Christ. Let's remain standing as we together now we confess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, 
who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Well, it's me. I was told I was all ages talk. Okay. Well, can I talk from here? I'll quickly convert it from a children's talk to an all ages talk. <laughs> okay. Rules, 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 rules. Ever since we've had COVID, we've had nothing but rules. When I go to the Belconnen Mall, rules. When I go to the restaurant, COVID rules. When I come to Holy Cross, COVID rules. Got to sign in. Identified myself. Use hand sanitizer. I've got to follow the arrows when I go to Holy Communion. Okay, I've got to stand at the rules. I've got to stand at these marks here. Okay. What's the rule about singing? No singing at all. Okay. One thing I miss is passing of the peace. Why can't we pass the peace? Not a rule is. We can't shake hands. Okay. Rules, rules, rules. Now, why do we have the COVID rules? Keep us. Keep people safe. So we have the rules... Because we care about people, correct? We care about the welfare of people, particularly older people. So there's two sets of rules. Agreed? We've got the COVID rules, but we also have the uh, caring rules. And the COVID rules derive from the caring rules. Caring rule to care for people, particularly the vulnerable. Now, what would happen if I was standing here? I started a wobble, and I, started, and I said, oh, I'm not feeling well, I faint. What do you do? Do you apply? Yeah, we got, well, I think Brenda, I think she'll put aside the COVID rules. I think she'd rush up here and apply the caring rule and check my vital signs, okay? So we can quite clearly say that the caring rule is much more important than the COVID rules because the COVID rule derives from the caring rule. Now, in the Old Testament, there was lots and lots of rules. Do you know how many rules there were? Uh, I think there were 613 rules, okay? And we heard in the Gospel reading, um, I think a legal person, I think it's a lawyer, I'm not too sure, asked Jesus a question, what's the most important rule? And Jesus said, well, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul. So love your God and, what was the other part? And love, love your neighbour as yourself. Now, there we are. It's interesting, Jesus says love yourself. We don't talk much about, much do we? We talk a lot about loving other people, but to love ourselves in a, in a healthy way and I think it's very relevant with mental illness and what have you but Jesus does tell you to, to, to love ourselves in a healthy sort of way and Jesus also tells us that this rule love, your, love the Lord your God and also love other people as yourself all other rules in the Bible are dependent on this particular rule and the prominent word of course as we can see in that important rule that Jesus gave us is the, world, is the word love. Because the very nature of God is love. God is love. So let's finish with a prayer. Lord God, we thank you for the important rules about loving you with all our heart, soul, mind and loving others and also to love ourselves in a healthy way. 
We ask that you work within us and strengthen us so that we can live by these important rules. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Dear friends in Christ, grace, mercy and peace from God our Father and his Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> thank you, Jeff, for your words about laws and the law of love. It's, thank you. And today we've actually got quite an, a busy agenda on our church plate. Our normal gospel reading, which you've just heard and Jeff has already explained, from Matthew 22, has Jesus being asked another tricky question. But Lutheran churches across the world today, of course, are also celebrating Reformation Day. And that falls on October 31st, next Saturday. And the Gospel reading for Reformation Day comes from the Gospel of John. But I reckon we can combine our reading from Matthew with a consideration of the Reformation as well. And for some of you who may be sort of new to our Lutheran understanding, may not be all that familiar with the Reformation, so I'm just going to say, begin with a few words about what that means for us. So 503 years ago, on the eve of All Saints Day, October 31st, 1517, there was a monk in Germany by the name of Martin Luther who nailed on the door of the castle church in a city in, of Wittenberg, sort of southern Germany, uh, a list of 95 theses or statements, debating points is what they were. And he requested a meeting of the church leaders to discuss and debate the substance of these 95 theses. Martin Luther, you see, was protesting against widespread abuses that were occurring in the Catholic Church at that time. And at the time, Luther, Martin Luther had no idea what drastic changes this simple act would bring upon the church. But posting those 95 theses began a chain reaction that resulted in the events that we know today as the Protestant Reformation. And what Martin Luther achieved was the liberation of the gospel, which had been swamped by laws and corrupt practices of the Catholic Church at that time. But of course Jesus began the Reformation of the Church 1500 
years earlier than Luther. And in our readings today from the Gospel of Matthew, we've been learning, learning about uh, Jesus' debates with the religious elites of his day, principally the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And today, like last Sunday's Gospel reading, these religious leaders have set up debates by asking, God, uh, by asking Jesus tricky questions. They're intent on trapping Jesus, you see, because they see Jesus as a real threat to their power and authority. 1,500 years later, of course, the Catholic authorities saw Luther in much the same way. They saw him as a threat to their power and authority and they had him excommunicated. Now, Jesus, of course, was killed for being a threat to the Jewish leaders at his time. In our Gospel reading today, one of the Pharisees asked Jesus, Teacher, which commandment in the law is the greatest? Like the Catholic authorities in Luther's time, the Pharisees, you see, just loved their law. They probably expected Jesus to uh, quote a commandment from their book of laws, the Torah. And yes, he obliges them in, in, in a way. So he quotes from the commandment in Deuteronomy, Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. Jesus rightly calls it the greatest and the first commandment. But adding first as a qualifier indicates there's more to come. Wait, there's more. And Jesus immediately uh, adds the second commandment from Leviticus 19.18, which Pam read earlier. Love your neighbour as yourself. So while the first commandment represents the vertical dimension of faith, God to human relationship, the second commandment represents the horizontal dimension, human to human, people to people relationship. The second commandment is comparable to the first in emphasis and significance, though. Jesus is asserting that these two commandments belong together. You cannot have one without the other. The second commandment is built on the first, but the first is not complete without the second. That's what he's saying. Loving our neighbours is to a great extent an act of loving God. You cannot claim to love God unless you do everything in your capacity to love your neighbours. Jesus has already been highlighting the horizontal dimension, love your neighbour as you love yourself, and that continues to be central to his mission. However, since our ability to focus on the horizontal dimension is generated by our relationship with God, the vertical dimension, Jesus does not emphasise the horizontal alone. And on the other hand, if he just emphasises the vertical dimension, he would be undermining the heart of his mission here on earth. He cannot emphasise the first commandment to the exclusion of the second, nor can he fulfil the second without attending to the first commandment. Within the context of Jesus' mission in Matthew's Gospel, the vertical commandment from Deuteronomy cannot be substituted for the horizontal. Our love of God should extend itself to love and care for our neighbours. Jesus had already confronted the Pharisees on such matters, specifically about how their emphasis on the Sabbath laws ignored, actually, the basic needs of the people, such as hunger, which we find in Matthew 12. And he also criticised them for their insistence on maintaining certain traditions that were lacking in empathy and the care of vulnerable people. In chapter 23 of Matthew, just after the, our reading today, Jesus offers a series of woes against religious leaders, specifically the Pharisees. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites! 
You give a tenth of your spices, mint, dill and cumin, but you have neglected the more important matters of the law. Justice, mercy and faithfulness. Matthew chapter 23 verse 13. His words were a forceful indictment against religious leaders who have been undermining the interests of their vulnerable neighbours and using religion as a cover for their greed and hypocrisy. The same actually could be said for the religious leaders in Luther's time. They too had lost empathy and care for the vulnerable people in their day. Their corrupt practices, including the sale of indulgences, placed immense burdens on the general population. And this is what provoked Luther to write those 95 theses. And you could call them actually a whole series of woes, if you like, against the Catholic Church. 95 of them. In our Gospel reading, Jesus ends his exchange with the Pharisees by calling upon what they knew all too well, the law and the prophets. Now the law requires righteousness, to an expression of commitment to God's will. The prophets demanded justice for the people at the margins of society, like the orphan and the widow. The original understanding of righteousness and justice has the connotation of being in right relationships with God and with people. Accordingly, righteousness and justice are intrinsically connected and are based upon being in right relationship with God and with your fellow human beings. You cannot be in right relationship with God unless you do everything possible to be in right relationship with your neighbours as well. Loving God then should be at the core of our faith, but it is incomplete by itself. If our love for God does not translate into love for neighbours, near and far, or even worse, prevents us from loving our neighbours, it's then just a facade designed to cover up our indifference and our hostility to our neighbours. So this text then is a reminder that our identity as people of faith depends on our ability and willingness to ensure justice for our neighbours who may be denied the most basic of human rights. But commitment to justice is never an abstract idea though, but it should manifest itself in concrete and practical ways of caring. Similarly, while we are called to pray in situations of oppression, our prayers seeking justice for the oppressed should become a catalyst for action rather than a substitute for action. Just as Luther was catapulted into action because of the suffering of the people at the hands of the church leaders of his time. But the great truth that Luther rediscovered is that the right relationship with God and with neighbour began with the wonderful reconciling act of justification with God, that God in Christ Jesus won for all people across, on that cross on a mound of dirt known as Calvary just outside of the city of Jerusalem. That profound act of grace freed all people to look beyond themselves and to see their neighbours in a totally new light. So we're going to celebrate this morning the love and grace that Jesus Christ has given us and offers us again this morning in the sacred meal we call Holy Communion. Know the truth that God has given us and live the freedom we have because of this, because of this in our care and, and empathy for our neighbours. And now may the peace of God, which passes all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.
Let us pray. You, wonderful God, whose glory the heavens declare and whose handiwork the whole earth sees, be with astronomers and astronauts, artists, photographers, bushwalkers and lots of other people. You, whose spirit brooded over the face of the earth and brought breath to all that lives and grows, be with health workers who control viruses and bacteria or engineer genes and chromosomes. You, for whom truth is not mere facts and figures, but relationship and the gift of eternal love. Be with those whose science has left them empty or whose technology has become a slavery. You, who give us faith that leads to many doubts and deep doubts that lead to a larger faith. Be with all agnostics and those who despair and all the pure of heart who hunger for you. You who have created us for fulfilment and joy and do not rest while one lost person is in misery. Be with those who are lost in amusement arcades, online gaming or social media. You who should mother and f you who should mother and father forsake us, cherish us as your very own family. Be abused with abused children and street kids, social workers, magistrates and foster parents. You, who when thick darkness covered humanity, leapt into the night, bringing light and joy. Be with night shift workers and police, evangelists, counsellors and pastors. You, whose firstborn perfect child covered our sins and bore our griefs. Be with mothers and midwives, the falsely accused and sorely abused. You, who banish fears and bring a new dawn, who swallow up death in victory. Be with those who risk their lives for others and all who today face death alone. You, who know our needs before we utter them and do far more than we can ask or imagine, be with us as we offer these prayers and with those who have forgotten how to pray. Through Jesus Christ, our brother and saviour. Amen. We pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Go now with the courage in our God, declare the message of the gospel which God has entrusted to us, and in wholehearted love for God and for others, share not only the message, but your very selves. May God be your haven, may Christ Jesus lead you into love, heart, soul and mind, and may the Holy Spirit Bless the work of your hands and gladden your days. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ, Amen.